everybody. I'm Luna. Welcome back to Luna Oi. About a year ago, I made a video about how elections work in Vietnam. And in that video, I discuss how democratic centralism is one of the basic ideological principles of not only the Communist Party of Vietnam, but also the whole political system of Vietnam. In this video, I will explain democratic centralism more fully and explain how it's used by our government and many other organizations here in Vietnam. But before we can begin to describe democratic centralism, you need to know more about dialectical materialism, the guiding philosophy of scientific socialism, and the official ideological foundation of the Communist Party of Vietnam. Dialectical materialism is a philosophy first formalized by Marx, Engels, and then Lenin, which builds upon various earlier philosophies. One of the key concepts of dialectical materialism is that all things, phenomena, and ideas are defined by their internal and external relationships. Basically, everything affects everything else, and this is what leads to change and development. Everything in our universe develops and changes over time, and what drives this development are internal and external relationships. In dialectical materialism, we don't think of anything as being metaphysically static or distinct from any other concept. This might sound complicated, and if so, don't worry. There are links to some good videos on the basics of dialectical materialism in the description. But to try to put it simply, whenever this affects that, that also affects this. I change you, you also change me, and these mutual impacts are what drive all development of everything in our universe. This includes the concept of democracy and centralism. Democracy and centralism are not and cannot be metaphysically distinct from one another. But before I explain, let's define these terms. Democracy is freedom for members of a group to express their opinions and their thoughts and any ideas they come up with and to participate in decision making. While centralism means that members of the group strive for unity in ideology, strategy, and action. Democracy is one of the earliest recorded concepts of political philosophy. The word democracy itself originates from a type of civil organization in the city-state of Athens, Greece, dating back to about 500 years BC, with democracy meaning people's power in Greek. In Vietnamese, the word for democracy is dân chủ. Dân means the people, and chủ means to own or to be master. So dân chủ literally means ownership by the people or the people are the masters. There is no universal definition of democracy that all human beings can agree on. But in popular perception, democracy is usually understood as a form of organization and state institution in which the power of the people is respected. Most people can probably agree that in democratic societies, power belongs to the people, and the will of the people is respected by social systems and institutions. Though it might shock you to hear me say this, but democracy is not always a good thing. What I mean by that is, sometimes democracy can lead to oppression. If democracy only exists for one class or group of people, or it can lead to chaos and division or even tyranny of the majority, such as in the Deep South when white people generally supported Jim Crow and segregation laws which severely oppressed black people. In 1965, a clear majority of Southerners believed the government was moving too quickly in enacting civil rights laws and ending segregation. This is clearly a situation where democracy was not a good thing. And the central authority of the federal government enforcing civil rights laws onto Southern people was obviously a good thing. Another thing to understand about the principle of democracy is that it can vary significantly from place to place and culture to culture. For example, in the Asian Barometer poll conducted by National Taiwan University, the Vietnamese had a unique definition of democracy. The Vietnamese people popularly define democracy as social equity more than any other nation. In the same poll, most other nations in Asia define democracy as good governance, and almost no nation in Asia define democracy as freedom and liberty. 
These popular definitions of democracy are much different from the popular definitions of democracy in the USA, where democracy is heavily associated with things like media freedom and religious freedom. So even though the basic idea of democracy has become popular all around the world, the ways in which people and political institutions define democracy can vary significantly from place to place and over time. And sometimes different definitions of democracy are even contradictory with each other. While Vietnamese people tend to see social equity as a defining characteristic of democracy, many in the capitalist nations consider social equity to be opposed to democracy, since popular capitalist notions of freedom tend to put the needs and demands of capitalists to accumulate wealth and operate freely in the market over the demands of social equity for the working class in defining democracy. For example, in Western capitalist countries, people call themselves the free world and call the countries following the socialist path totalitarian or authoritarian regimes. In contrast, socialist countries define state regimes as a people's democracy and consider Western regimes as a bourgeois democracy, that is, democracy which exists only for the bourgeoisie. In short, even though understanding the true meaning of democracy and building democratic institutions have been some of the primary goals of humanity for centuries, now it is not easy at all for humanity to agree universally on the definition of democracy, and we are still on the path of defining and discovering democratic values around the world. As for centralism, this is probably the more misunderstood word when it comes to democratic centralist philosophy. Just as democracy can sometimes be bad, centralism can very often be good. It all depends on the characteristics and form of centralism. When centralism comes from autocracy, dictatorship, suppression, and coercion is almost always a bad thing. Although coercing white southerners in the USA by forcing them to adopt civil rights act laws was clearly a good thing in the 1960s, but that's not really what I'm talking about. Centralism can, and in the opinion of Marxist-Leninists, should be developed by building consensus and unity with the people. It might help to think of good centralism in this sense as harmony. Marxist-Leninists seek harmony as we build centralism, and this harmony helps to further develop our democratic systems in positive directions. So you see, contrary to Western liberal philosophies, democracy and centralism are not completely distinct and opposed to one another as a dichotomy, where the more democracy you have, the less centralism you have, and the more centralism you have, the less democracy you have. And democracy in and of itself is not inherently a good or bad thing, and neither is centralism. It all depends on the form and characteristics which democracy and centralism have and the ways in which they mutually develop one another. Rather than seeing democracy and centralism as static or distinct from each other and mutually exclusive and oppositional, we see democracy and centralism as having a dialectical relationship with each other meaning that they are defined in large part by their relationship with one another. You just can't have any sort of cohesive group of human beings without both democracy and centralism. If there is absolutely no democracy whatsoever, it would mean that only one human being has complete control over every other member, which is just impossible. Even emperors and absolute monarchs throughout history have had to worry about power struggles and diplomacy with different sectors of human society. There has never been a human society where only one human being made all the decisions whatsoever. What varies from one society to another is the degree of democracy and the form of democracy. Of course, it's possible that dominant classes and rulers can use force to prevent other classes from participating in group decision making. Under capitalism, workers have access only to illusionary democratic systems and elections, but they don't really have a voice, which has been proven in countless studies. And importantly, they do not have any direct ownership of their own labor. Capitalist workplaces are not democratic, in the sense that the owner of the company has total control over the operation of the business. However, it is possible for workers to use force to demand some degree of control over the workplace by forming a union, going on strike, and so on. Even people who were enslaved 
historically were able to impact the systems which enslaved them in various ways through acts of rebellion, resistance, and other sorts of collective actions. The point I'm making is, every group of human beings has some degree of democracy, even if it's an extremely cruel and unjust form of democracy, or a form of democracy which relies heavily on illusion and fake democratic systems and sham elections. There are always various ways in which members of the group can affect the social group as a whole and demand a voice, even if the amount of resistance and suppression to popular sentiment within the political system is quite high. You also just can't have a human social group without some degree of central unity. This is really obvious, right? If there is absolutely no unity in thought, strategy, and action, then it's not a group at all. It's just an incohesive bunch of individuals, not a social group. You can have a social group with an emphasis on centralism and a lack of democracy, like an autocratic dictatorship. Though dictatorships are prone to failing when some other individual or group rises up in a revolution or a coup. You can also have a social group with very little centralism and a lot of democracy. Though these kinds of groups tend to be very short-lived, since members will tend to undermine the group and break away if there is very little unity of thought, purpose, and action. Most political movements which have fallen apart throughout history have fallen apart due to a lack of central unity in vision and strategy, collapsing and splintering into disarray and infighting. What we believe as Marxist-Leninists is that it's possible to develop both democracy and centralism within a human organization or society at the same time. Not only that, but having strong and well-designed systems of democracy will bolster central unity in theory and practice, just as having well-aligned centralism will enhance democracy. And of course, it can work in the opposite direction. Poorly designed democracy will break down central unity of purpose and action, which will cause democracy to further break down as factions develop to tear the organization apart. In other words, democracy and centralism have a dialectical relationship. They mutually impact one another. Better democracy helps build better centralism. Best centralism makes democracy worse, and so on and so forth. So our goal as political activists and organizers and revolutionaries is to understand and leverage the dialectical relationship between democracy and centralism so that they mutually develop one another to make our movement stronger, more resilient, more democratic, and more unified over time. So remember, democracy and centralism are always developing and changing one another over time within any given group of human beings. And our job is to understand that mutual development as we build our revolution. And we have to understand how democracy and centralism developed one another over time. If you look at the state of democracy and centralism within a group of human beings at any given point in time, you're really only looking at a snapshot of how democratic and how centralized the group is at that moment. Over time, these dynamics will change as centralized and democratic characteristics continue to influence and develop each other along with other characteristics of the group over time. As one example, back in the 1970s, before the Doi Mui reforms, the political economy of Vietnam was way more centralized since we had a planned economy under the subsidizing system. I have a video on that, link is in the description. But anyway, that system didn't work out for a number of reasons, and so we instituted the Doi Mui reforms. Doi Mui means renovation, and basically it means we move to the socialism-oriented market economy which we have today, and the government and economy became less centralized than it was in the 1970s, though it is still more centralized than bourgeois liberal democracies, since the government and Communist Party still exert a huge amount of control over the economy through price stabilization programs, state-owned institutions, heavy regulation, moratoriums on corporate ownership of farmland, and many other centralized controls are generally weaker or don't exist in liberal free market capitalist economies. And this economy is just another stage in our development. In the future, we will move on to another stage of development. Specifically, our goal is to move into a fully socialist economy, which will be the next step in the road towards the stateless, classless society of communism.
Throughout this entire process, characteristics of centralism and democracy will constantly change. And the goal of democratic centralism is to understand the relationship between centralism and democracy and to prevent ineffective or counterproductive development. Through the philosophy of democratic centralism, we try to enhance the strength of our system while chipping away at the weaknesses. Since we understand that changes in centralism are driven by changes in democracy and vice versa, we can do a better job at managing our situation as it constantly develops over time. If you're unfamiliar with dialectical materialism, this probably sounds counterintuitive. How can becoming more democratic lead to more centralization? In liberal democracies like the UK and the USA, the ideological propaganda claims that centralization is the opposite of democracy. To prove that these concepts aren't opposite to one another and that they can be used to develop one another in positive directions, let's take a look at Vietnam's land reform policy. Vietnam is predominantly agricultural nation. 70% of Vietnamese people are farmers. Going all the way back to the 1920s and 30s, the vast majority of Vietnamese farmers wanted to own their own land, and they wanted to get rid of the capitalists and feudal landlords. In the 1950s, after kicking out the French colonizers, who had dominated us for a century, the Communist Party began a gradual process of giving the Vietnamese people what they wanted, ownership of their own land. Land was reclaimed from French colonialists and seized from traditional feudal and capitalist landlords and distributed to the people, which was precisely what the people wanted. In this sense, Vietnamese land reform increased both democracy and centralism, since most Vietnamese people wanted land to belong only to farmers. The land was more centralized in the sense that only one class of people, individual and family farmers, could own land and the centralization of our nation was enhanced because the vast majority of people got what they wanted. This built more unity in vision, thought, and action among the farmers of Vietnam, and it was more democratic since the masses made the decision to seize this land through revolutionary means, and their voices were heard. So you see, democracy and centralism can advance together, and this is the goal of democratic centralism in Marxism-Leninism. It is true that democracy and centralism can also deteriorate each other, causing one, the other, or both to take a step back in the wrong direction. Everything hinges on the way the relationship between democracy and centralism leads to development. So democratic centralism is really just a study of the relationship between democracy and centralism, and the practical application of this study to create organizations, movements, and nations which develop democracy and centralism in an optimized manner, so that the people can have a unity in action while giving everyone as much of a voice as possible. In part two of this series, we will take a look at what Marx, Engels, and Lenin had to say about democratic centralism. And then in part three, we will talk about how democratic centralism works in practice here in modern day Vietnam. Once the videos are done, I will put the links in the description. In the meantime, I hope you will subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any videos. And if you feel like you've learned something useful, I hope you will consider supporting me on Patreon or better yet, Camaraderie, a cooperatively owned anti-fascist and anti-capitalist alternative to Patreon, or if you're broke, to share my videos with your comrades. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in part two. Bye.